to just a second, set it up, and then move it. Just go down to the just Perfect, down. great. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here. Much of what I have to say will synergize, though may occasionally disagree with Ian, so that's good. And afterwards, we can t I'm not so sure I agree with cognitive decline across the lifespan, but we can talk about that. But it's particularly fitting to be having this session uh, dedicated to an Ulster poet, uh, Patrick McGill, who not only had a keen sense of social justice and of the unspoken in Irish life, but also had a sense of the positivities of ageing, even in the context of loss, as we can see in this extract from the poem Slantia, which ends up, they are happy for the day that was theirs leaves no regrets, and peace is theirs and perfection. And summer schools with their mix of arts, advocacy, politics and academia are a recognition that there are complex issues in life that need a broader and deeper discussion and there is no area of life as broad or as deep as that of ageing. But the focus on poetry is interesting. W.B. Yeats said, we make of our quarrels with others rhetoric. We make of quarrels with ourselves poetry. And indeed, the biggest issue, and it echoes with Ian, is our ambivalence, our deep-seated ambivalence about our own ageing. In fact, the longevity revolution has given us effectively an extra five hours a day. Most of you have been time poor during your lives, so we now have got a 29-hour day. Those five hours will be a little bit later, but they are still there. And yet, not only that, but we're living fitter and longer. We know from a study published in England, not only is longevity increasing, but significant disability-free longevity is increasing. Even more interesting, without people doing brain training and all sorts of other things, dementia rates have almost halved in northeastern America, admittedly among an upper-middle-class uh, population, uh, and this is really encouraging as mirrored by findings elsewhere. And indeed, the most interesting factor involved in the dropping of the dementia rate is that of education. So little did Don O'Malley realise that when he started free secondary education in Ireland, he would have a really long-lasting legacy. But we still know that many people are exceptionally negative about ageing, and we need to, perhaps to turn to the poet T.S. Eliot, who beautifully puts how we should approach issues in life. And the first and obvious response is, what are we going to do about it? But the more important one is, what does it mean, and how does one relate to it? and this is the focus of my 15 to 18 minutes, Anne, uh, is how does ageing mean to me? So your challenge today is do you truly believe in the longevity dividend, which I'm going to explore? Do you truly welcome your own ageing? And I have significant reason to believe many of you don't. And do you understand and embrace your existential vulnerability, which is part and parcel of ageing? So... Where can we start with this? And I start with another Ulster poet. And I had a wonderful uh, Damascene moment. I used to love this poem by Patrick Kavanagh. Every old man I see reminds me of my father, seduced by the poetry, the urban imagery. But then I began to get uneasy. And as the son of a, an aging and finally dying father, I began to rebel against Patrick Kavanagh. Because no old man had ever reminded me of my father, who defied replication as a Stradivarius de equally defies replication. And then I realized that no old man I'd ever seen re re uh, reminded me of any other old man, because the key hallmark of aging is indiv increasing inter-individual variability. As we say in gerontology, we're born copies, but we die originals. And <laughs> our biggest challenge is that people keep trying to shoehorn ageing into simplistic tropes. And there's two key tropes which we need to be mindful of. The first is that of a, a, an unspeakable burden, the tsunami, the grey tsunami, the pensions time bomb, the unsustainability. And again, if you, there's a history of these predictions over the year, and they keep tripping themselves up. And I think it's really important that we uh, are aware of this. And as Ian said, he talked about having negative self-images of ageing, uh, that you walk slower, well, actually, it's much worse than that, and we'll, there's, a, there's even more worse things happen. But what it does, it generates a series of myths into the uh, public space about ageing, none of which are true. First and foremost, that older people are unproductive, they're a net economic drain. So we know from Kevin Murphy's studies, we know from UCL studies, we know from Axel Bohr, Supan, and the SHARE study in Europe, this is not so. 
The aging of the population increases healthcare costs. It doesn't. Most of the healthcare spend is on the technology and the upper middle age, lower old age. And in fact, there's a misspend, and we could actually make great efficiencies if we age to tune the system. Pension costs are unsustainable. Read Joe Stiglitz on Social Security. Massive increase needed in nursing homes. I have references for all these, by the way. I have sent Joe Mulholland the paper so people can have them. 11% increase in the over 65s in the UK in the last decade. A flatlining of nursing home places. People, there is not a massive increase needed. We have deficiencies in urban areas, but there isn't a massive increase needed overall. Loneliness, most common amongst older people, is the thing that drives me nuts. And Mary McAleese, God bless her, she was obsessed with lonely old men. Loneliness peaks. <laughs> she wants to do all these things. I, look, loneliness is bad at any age, but it peaks between the ages of 15 and 35. Think of the catcher in the eye. Think of Rev Revolutionary Road. Older drivers are more risky. This is where I would contest Ian's issue on cognition, because actually I think there's other sorts of cognition that improve. And the list goes on and on. So we're not only like turkeys voting for Christmas, we're actually preheating the oven and self-basting. <laughs> and the sad thing is, we, we don't seem to have yet moved on fully uh, to realise the words of the great Robert Butler, a fantastic polymath geriatrician, who just over 40 years ago wrote that the tragedy of old age is not the fact that each of us must grow old and die, but the process of doing so has been made unnecessarily and times excruciatingly painful, humiliating, debilitating and isolating through my highlighting insensitivity, ignorance and poverty. And this is something we've got to deal with. The second trope we run into is the aging denying one and I love this sort of caricature from the New York Times uh, on the exercise bike doing the Sudoku, the oily fish meal on the side and all the books now of course these are all good things but in fact much of the improvement that's happening in our cognition and health are largely secular trends to do with broader education and of course we should do these things but it leads into very nasty tropes like this advertisement Old, me, never. Now, if you're to say wrinkly, me, never, that's fine. Or you to say lacking energy, me, never, that's fine. Although, again, we might discuss that. But, you know, if this were a race-defying, a gender-defying defying ad, people would be cross. Yet you as a group, nobody raised a peep about this. This book beside it, of course, why wouldn't I be strong, fit, and sexy after 80? But why should that be younger? In fact, what we want is less frail. And again, to tie into what Ian said about having, if you've negative stereotypes about aging, you then get people beginning to think that dying at 75, fit and healthy, is better than living into uh, later life. And this is really uh, troubling and worrying. And we know if you hold negative stereotypes of aging from Lindau's study, you're more likely to die younger, you respond less well to treatment, and here's the thing, you're more likely to be lonely in later life if you hold a negative stereotype of ageing. So we've got to turn your individual thoughts on ageing uh, around. So, how do we go? And again, poets and literary sources are great for this. The great uh, Austrian playwright Thomas Bernhard has this wonderful play called Einfach Kompliziert, simply complicated. It's about an ageing actor. And this should be our motto about ageing, is that it's simply complicated. And there are not simple responses to it. You'll see that everything is complicated in this world. Everything looks easy, but it's very complicated. Everything is complicated. So when I'm trying to get across this combination of the longevity dividend associated with existential vulnerability, I'm looking for a metaphor, because it's a complex idea. And who gives us the best metaphors? The great artists. So this is the first slide I show my students whenever, I, or my trainees, or whoever, and it's this wonderful, vibrant, change of style, fabulous, three metre by three metre artwork. Somebody who's 83 but not only 83, but actually bed and chair bound, as Matisse was for the last seven years of his life. So what this art of the demographic or longevity dividend does is twofold. First of all, we see the art of the demographic dividend. But we also need to learn the art of generating a discourse that says, yes, I can have vulnerabilities, cognitive, physical, but I can also be me, I can be important to others, I am integral, I am complete. And this is really where late-life creativity gives us a wonderful platform for exploring this. And once you open this box, it's the gift that keeps on giving. 
and why might it keep giving and what's the, in the background of this and Ian again I think expressed some of this around uh, stress and stressors and Goethe put it even more poetically in der Beschränkung zeigt sich erst der Meister it is in being constrained that the master first shows himself and one of the most important theories of ageing is Laura Carstensen's socio-emotional selectivity theory, whereby if you put people close to vulnerability, morbid sickness, severe sickness and death, they will make choices that are more meaningful, that have more relevance, that are more valid. And actually, if you remove them from those sources, they then revert back to type. So in fact, our existential, late life creativity does not happen in spite of old age, it happens because of old age. And no better person than Samuel Beckett backs this up. He has this lovely phrase talking to Lawrence Scheinberg. I always thought old age would be the writer's best chance. Whenever I read the late work of Goethe or W.B. Yeats, I had the impertinence to identify with it. Now my memory's gone. All the old fluency's disappeared. I don't write a single sentence without saying to myself, it's a lie. So I know I was right. It's the best chance I've ever had. And this ties in with Robert Butler's Life Course Review, where at the end of life we begin to make sense of all those things that happen to us. The gift that keeps on giving, and again, uh, Richard Strauss's Metamorphosen about his role in the destruction of Germany. So it's about loss, but it's also vibrant and something you want to hear. Dr. Seuss's wonderful book, You're Only Old Once, written at the age of 82, and it's about his journey through the health system, but it's bright, it's colorful, it's witty. He's asserting himself. He's giving us something back. So again, loss and gain at the same time. And it just keeps going on. Clint Eastwood, late movie, Leonard Cohen. I have to say I hated the miserableism of his bedsit early uh, LPs, whereas the late stuff, particularly uh, old ideas, this wonderful phrase where he tells us about aging and that you can be smart and sexy and make nine million dollars in his 2009 tour. <laughs> so when people talk about the economic burden of older people, just think nine million dollars. And then this wonderful phrase, like a broken hearted banjo bobbing in a dark infested sea. So we learn so much through the late life um, dividend. But what I would say is and I had a particularly uh, wonderful experience this uh, last year in the Abbey where we did a, I, I was involved with doing a version of A Midsummer's Night Dream where all of the cast were over 60, some were over 70 and a few were over 80. And it was the most wonderful experience. And in fact, uh, this phrase here which the Lance had picked out, as we glimpse the inner life and complexity of older people, we cannot retreat to a vision defined by their disability. So... However, I'm not here to give a hagiography on late life, and people can be evil and mean in later life. So here's three completely competent people, Marshall Pétain, Sepp Blatter, and Robert Mugabe, and yet they're evil and have done much harm. So this is not a hagiography. Not all older people are, 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 are fine and nice, but yet capabilities and competences remained. So where to? Where do we have to go to? The first thing we've got to do is we've got to get rid of what I call barstool gerontology. Barstool gerontology, sure, we all know what uh, older people want. We all know what they need. And we've got to actually embrace something of the sciences of ageing. And this is a really important aspect. So, for example, I'm very interested in the age-friendly uh, communities, but I'm a little anxious around that they actually perhaps don't turn to ask a little bit about the science of what's happening around uh, age-friendly communities. So that's the first thing. It's about embracing and looking to the sources. And indeed, anybody who's interested, we did a course in Trinity, a uh, um, massive online open course. As you've come to realize in a few minutes, I don't like the title because it's about successful aging. And I think that's an oxymoron and problematic. But actually, it's, it's for, if you look up MOOC, M-O-O-C, actually the content of it is very good. But we've got to understand that, therefore, how do we sustain and support people in, in vulnerability? And I have to say, we have to realize that this poem by somebody in his 80s, uh, Thomas Kinsler, to my mind, one of the finest of the, Irish, of the Irish poets, is this is what our old age should be and how we manage it. I saw there a number of elders in an intimate companionship, their old shapes without shame playing with one another, with all that remained of the barbed shafts of love. And I heard one of them saying to those around her, we cannot renew the gift, but we can drain it to the last drop. 
So we've got to remind ourselves that we have a significant chance, all of us, of spending some of the later part of our life with physical cognitive disabilities, and we want a system that's age-proofed and dementia-proofed. And I'm going to have a brief few minutes on that. And the first thing that we've got to do is change our language. So, for example, I have a terrible time with my sub-editors in the Irish Times who keep throwing elderly into my heads of my titles. We do not call African Americans by titles that they don't want. We don't call LGBT people by titles they don't want. Yet people are promiscuous with the use of the word elderly and older Europeans and the UN Human Rights um, uh, Commission have asked us not to use the word elderly and you just see it uh, all over the place, even sadly in geriatrics and gerontology journals. Caregiver burden, all too often used in this awful picture from the Journal of the American Medical Association. I am a carer of my mother. I want to look after her. She was a great foil for this talk. I said, what do you think of ageing and going up to uh, Glenties? And she paused and she said, it happens. So, um, <laughs> but I'm a subscriber to the wonderful Arthur Kleinman, who looked after his wife with early onset Alzheimer's, is actually that care is a hugely important part of our moral formation. And actually, nothing gives me heartburn more than hear people say, I don't want to be a burden. Not wanting to be a burden is actually one of the greatest burdens of all. And actually, I want to care for my mother. The state impedes and the system impedes me. That's not the care or burden. That's the burdensome aspects of care. Successful ageing, I have to say, uh, Verpi Timonen in uh, Trinity has just written a fantastic book uh, uh, filleting out the false hope and optimism, again, a somewhat anti-ageing trend of this term, successful ageing. It had an important role 30 years ago. But actually, if you set up a definition of successful ageing, and through no fault of your own, you've done that exercise bike, you've eaten loads of salmon and mackerel, you've done all your Sudoku, you still can get disability. So have you failed? And so I love this paper from Canada. I may be frail, but I ain't no failure. And I think what we need to move to is a phrase that puts the control of what you think is good for you in ageing back in your hands, and it needs to be optimal ageing. So language is hugely important. There is an element of nominative determination in much of what we do. So what I would ask you, instead of course exercise and eat mackerel, particularly somewhere where there'd be nice mackerel like here, but actually... Where you should be putting your energies is not in denying the downsides of ageing or the inevitable existential vulnerability, but creating a political discourse that puts a premium on us becoming older people, on gerontological expertise, and where optimal ageing is defined as a common fate for us all. I'm, and the final glide path now, Anne, um, it's... It's, almost ten, it's exactly 10 years, it'll be 10 years in November, when uh, the Lee's Cross report was published. And although much has improved, we still remain enormously behind the curve. And I want you, uh, we know from Australia that a third of older women and a quarter of older men will spend some time in a nursing home before uh, they die. And I think we must build nursing homes as if you or I were going to live there. And the current movement is what's called the greenhouse movement, where you build small units of 10 with one or two sitting rooms, like a domestic environment with a small dining room with feeding onto a public area with activities. And this has been shown by all sorts of ways to be the way to go forward. And again, I live in a house with nine people, and it's a very good simulacrum of uh, what it's like to be in a nine-person unit. And any more than that would be very challenging. But look what we find. And there is... There is a sad gap. We all avert our eyes. We don't seem to understand that each of us, we need to be building, you know this joke you see, you know, be nice to your children that choose your nursing home. Well, actually, be nice to yourselves because you're the people that create the political discourse that says this is absolutely disgraceful. We've allowed nursing homes to become marginalized ex-Celtic tiger hotel blocks between the M50 and, and, a, and a waste tip and instead of having greenhouse type units. So, can I say, wake up, wake up. To change this ship of state, it's going to take time. And that's why I would say to you, I, I turn back to poetry, to two poets, Rainer Maria Rilke, and I just love this phrase, because we need to live the question now. Perhaps then, someday, far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. And we've got to live our way into that answer. But I'll finish with, I have to say, one of my favourite poets, Czesław Miłosz, and this is written as he came to his 90th year, and I think it's deeply affecting and catches loss, life course review, synthesis, mastery. Not soon, 
As late as the approach of my 90th year, I felt a door opening in me and I entered the clarity of early morning. One after another, my former lives were departing like ships together with their sorrow. And the country cities, gardens, the bays of seas assigned to my brush came closer, ready now to be described better than they were before. Thank you.